or for the experimental component. He is also a senior member of the IEEE, and Professor Guha holds joint appointments with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Program in Applied Mathematics at the University of Arizona. So today, Professor Guha joins us uh, and will uh, take us through a journey on quantum networks where he intends to cover a lot of topics, starting from the basics uh, to making a full-scale device and finally building the quantum internet. So over to you, Professor Guha. Thank you very much, Professor Sharma, uh, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Professor Deshmukh, for having me here. It was a, it's a great pleasure. Um, I will. Uh, what I decided to do is to give you a, a brief flavor for uh, uh, the uh, quantum internet, as people say. It. We don't have one yet. Um, uh, but Professor Sharma talked about the uh, Center for Quantum Networks, which is a ten-year-long program that I lead with a lot of my esteemed colleagues. Uh, across uh, many uh, universities and uh, uh, industry members across uh, mostly the US, but uh, we have a couple of um, uh, member institutions uh, in the industrial member set that are outside the US right now. So what I'll do is that I'll just give you a brief flavor for communication, classical communication and quantum communication. Why are we even building the quantum internet? And then um, do a little bit of a technical deep dive into the various different things that need to come together. To come to make it to come to fruition. It's a highly, highly transdisciplinary topic that spans many, many areas of science um, uh, and engineering uh, uh, and uh, many departmental uh, expertise areas. So these are the universities that are part of our center. Uh, it's, uh, it was started about three years ago. Uh, it is funded on National Science Foundation's Engineering Research Center program. So what is the quantum internet? Okay. So we are all familiar with today's classical internet. The internet's you know, the main service it provides us to, uh, to be able to send packets of bits from point A to point B uh, in a reliable fashion. Uh, it does a best effort communication of packets of bits that, that supports a whole variety of applications like the one that we are uh, using right now. The Zoom is, a, is an application that runs on the classical internet, uses this, that service of communications. Same is uh, true for voice over IP or when you're watching Netflix or all of these different applications. The quantum internet is the, uh, is the internet upgraded with a new service. The new service of being able to uh, send packets of qubits or quantum bits reliably from point A to point B. Um, that will support a whole wide variety of other applications that are not possible with today's internet. Now, how do we do that? Well, um, you require a new hardware to store qubits, uh, quantum memories, new hardware to be able to communicate qubits. And the only form of encoding of a qubit that can fly long distances is optical photons. It's very similar to classical bits. But then you have to be able to store those optical photonic qubits into kinds of storage devices that are, for example, built using atomic systems that can sit in one place and not fly from point A to point B and not decohere, not go away very quickly. Just like in classical computing and classical communications, we need gates. We need to be able to manipulate those qubits. So not only do we need memories, we need memories on which you can do gate operations on collections of qubits. Um, and in order to extend the range of communications, you need to build what are called quantum repeaters. I'll talk a little bit about what are quantum repeaters. The analogous thing in classical communications are uh, amplifiers and regenerators. But uh, optical amplifiers, um, they don't work for quantum communications. You need to build these little tiny quantum processors that can extend the reach of communications. And then uh, in addition to quantum repeaters, in the future, we, we may also, especially for intercontinental links, have satellite-assisted links that, that distribute entanglement among processor nodes that are stored at remote locations. Okay, So this is uh, just a cartoon of, of a quantum uh, internet. And uh, there are many, many applications that I will not have time to go into the applications today, including distributed quantum computing, uh, you know, entanglement uh, assisted, uh, highly precision uh, measurements uh, using networks of sensors, for example, uh, long baseline astronomy in, in a, a, a network of, uh, uh, you know, LIGO interferometers for gravitational wave measurements, space based networks, and so forth. And then there's a whole host of applications surrounding uh, security. 
So we often hear about, uh, you know, uh, secure communications, like in quantum key distribution, that's an application of entanglement. But there is all sorts of other applications like uh, private information retrieval, uh, private access to quantum computers on the cloud where, you know, the cloud provider does, cannot know what you're doing uh, with their quantum computer, unforgeable money and all sorts of applications in that arena of secure communication, secure computing and so forth. And uh, what I would say is that, you know, we probably are still scratching the surface in terms of uh, what kind of applications uh, will this new information currency enable. Now, one other thing I should say is that quantum communication, adding this new service to the internet is going to add more burden to the classical service that exists on the internet because quantum communication requires classical communications as, an, as a resource to support it. Um, so you'll have to carefully design the internet, this quantum internet, so that it does not add too much burden to the classical communication. So we have to be uh, very careful in that core design. So here's what I, my outline for today's talk will be. Uh, I'll start with uh, some basics of classical communications, uh, talk about quantum communications. What does it take to build one single link? And I'll spend most of my time on this second bullet point, just one link, meaning connecting two sites that have equipped with quantum memories to be able to distribute entanglement that are connected by say an optical link. What will it take to generate that link? And then after that, we'll see a little bit about how we connect those links to multiple links over long distances. How do we build a repeater and then a network? And then I'll give you a brief flavor for our center and some glimpses of uh, projects um, that surround that center in my research group uh, across multiple application areas. Okay, so let's start with classical communication. So I, I mentioned this Zoom conversation we are having right now. So let me just use that as, a, as an example. So I'm talking to on my computer speaker. It's an information source. It's an analog signal. It's my voice signal. And this analog signal is getting transduced into an electrical signal that roughly mimics that, that signal from that is coming from my uh, mouse, a pressure waveform, this electrical signal. And then you sample it. So my microphone's output is electrical uh, voltage or a current signal that is getting quantized. And this uh, repetition period over which you are uh, you are, uh, you are sampling these signals uh, is commensurate with the, uh, the, the bandwidth of my audio waveform that you want to preserve from the Nyquist criteria. And each of these samples are an analog value, which you then quantize into a sequence of zeros and ones. So each of this sample is say 110, that sample is 111. And then you put it through an error correction code that takes these little say chunks of three bits and it expands into say, six bits. I'm just showing an example, a rate one half code. And once you have the error correction code for each one of these encoded bits, you send a modulated symbol. Okay, so this is a modulator, takes a zero and let's say sends a laser pulse with a pi phase shift with some photon number. If you have a one, if you have uh, send a laser pulse with no, no phase shift. So there's a zero and pi phase shift. This is called binary phase shift keying modulation. So each of these are code word boundaries. And then you go through some noise and loss and distortion, optical dispersion in fiber, or all sorts of non-idealities. And you get the received code word in the receiver side. And then you receive it. So what you do is that you have to now convert it back to electrical domain. So this is optical code word. In any kind of receiver, whether it be homodyne receiver, heterodyne receiver, direct detection receiver, serodyne, there's all sorts of receiver techniques. Always, you typically use a, some form of an optical pre-processing step. There's a detection step. This detection step is, by the way, where you go from light to electron, photon to electron. So this is an irreversible process. It adds some irreversible noise to your signal. And uh, then there is some electronic signal processing and uh, that uh, outputs the guesses of these bits for each of these little modulation symbols. And you see that some of them are erroneous. This one got decoded as zero. And then you pass it through an error correction decoder. So your hope is that the errors are not so much such that the redundancy that you added during this error correction step was sufficient to correct for these errors so that you map back your, uh, your transmitted data back to the uh, the transmitted code word sequence that you got. Okay, and then after that point, it is just a reverse of quantization sampling and transduction. So you do interpolation, uh, which is the reverse of quantization. You do filtering, which is you know, reverse of sampling. And then another step of transduction, which is the you know, generation regeneration of the, of the audio signal in your end. And then you get back my voice signal with hopefully some tolerable amount of noise. 
Okay, so all of this happens in any classical communication, whether it be radio frequency, optical communication, no, any kind of communication. So even for classical communication, one could ask the question that if you look at this sequence of these BPSK signaling, binary phase shifting signaling, uh, if I, let's say, give you these eight code words, okay, so uh, eight code words, so there are 32 possible sequences of binary bits, but I tell you that only these eight BPSK code words I'm going to use to encode information. Uh, how do I decide which code word was received if this is if I receive one of them at my receiver? So normally what you would do is that you would detect each one of them one at a time and uh, using, let's say, homorine receiver. And then after that, you will do a maximum likelihood detection to tell which one was received. So if you use the best possible classical receiver, meaning one that can be whose actions can be correctly described by the classical the semi-classical theory of photo detection that detects each of these symbols and then use classical post-processing, you have a decoding error probability as a function of the mean photon number per pulse, which is given by this blue line. But then if you ask the question, what is the best possible receiver allowed by the laws of physics that can tell apart between these eight code words? It is given by this pink line. Uh, which is known as the Hellstrom limit or the quantum limit of minimum error probability to tell apart between a set of pure states. Now, interestingly enough, even though we are dealing with classical light, so quote unquote, no laser light, coherent state pulses, in order to get to this quantum limit, your receiver must use quantum processing within the confines of the receiver. So this paper, if you're interested, take a look that we, de we describe how uh, you can actually code up a little quantum processor or a quantum computer that can achieve this limit using an idea called uh, quantum uh, belief propagation. Okay, I will not go into detail about that. Then there is a question you can ask, what is the communications capacity? Meaning if I'm receiving a code word with individual modulation symbols whose uh, you know, mean photon number is n, how many bits of information can you encode per, per symbol? And that is given by something called the Holevo capacity. So if n is the mean photon number per pulse and you can each alpha i is a complex number, which is a, some amplitude or phase modulation, this is the number of bits you can pack in per symbol. If you allow yourself to make a general quantum limited receiver that acts on these long code word sequences. Now, to achieve this Holevo capacity, one requires quantum enabled receivers that act on collectively on, on a long sequence of optical pulses whose action itself cannot be described by symbol by symbol measurement on each one pulse at a time. So if I take this CN, which is the number of bits that I can encode per pulse and divide that by number of photons I'm receiving per pulse, what do I get? I get bits per photons. Okay, so this is my photon information efficiency. I'm putting that on my Y axis. In my X axis, I have number of bits that I'm encoding per pulse called the spectral efficiency or C of N. And this black thin line is the Holevo capacity, the maximum capacity that laws of physics allows us. And all of these non-black colored lines, they correspond to the different uh, standard optical receivers and modulation formats, but each individual one operating at their individual quantum noise limits. And there's a big gap between these, uh, what are called Shannon capacity limits of traditional uh, receivers and the Holevo limit. And this uh, gap especially is large in the low mean photon number regime. So the if your received photon flux per, per pulse is very low, which is the case for say deep space communications, for example, that's where you can get a factor of 10 to 20 improvement in the number of bits you can get uh, per second if you used um, a quantum limited receiver. So there was a whole um, three-year DARP project uh, that I ran on that many years ago. In 2010, I had a DARPA program called Information in a Photon. There was lots of work we did on that, um, which is becoming relevant now again, because uh, um, you know, people are getting interested in deep space communications for, say, for example, the Mars mission that NASA has uh, just, just launched. And we are going back 10, 12 years on some receivers and codes and quantum techniques we had developed and we are now tr um, trying to build them experimentally and take, seeing what will it take to build those receivers. Okay, so what uh, now I'm going to move to quantum communication, but I wanted to tell you that even for classical laser communications, that there is role for quantum to play within the confines of the receiver in order to get better performance. Okay, let's talk about quantum communications. So in quantum communications, you are sending qubits, not bits. And when people use the word quantum communication, they are typically referring to one of these three tasks. Sending qubits, 
reliably over a say a lossy optical channel generating shared entanglement between distant parties over say an optical channel or generating shared secret between distant parties this is what is referred to as quantum key distribution for example so task one and task two are identical and they are equivalent to each other if you also assume that additional classical communication is available as a free resource why so because if you can generate entanglement at a certain rate i can always use shared entanglement to send fresh qubits that i am holding using teleportation so the rate of shared entanglement generation, I can turn it into a rate of qubit communication or a quantum communication. Similarly, if you design the quantum network to send quantum bits reliably, and I actually want to distribute entanglement, I can generate local shared entanglement and one qubit of that entangled pair I can send using say error correction, modulation, whatever you design for quantum communication, and I would have achieved entanglement distribution at that rate. So these two tasks are equivalent to each other. And if I can do one of these two tasks, I can always change or can take shared entanglement and use a Eckert 91 protocol to convert that into shared keys through QKD. The thing is that all of these three tasks, their capacities, meaning in the, the number of qubits you can send per transmitted mode. Uh, uh, so you have to multiply this Y axis by a modes per second or an optical bandwidth number it could be say in megahertz or gigahertz, depending upon what's your reputation rate that you're modulating. The, the rate always is proportional to the law, the transmissivity in the channel when the transmissivity is uh, very low. So transmissivity means what is the fraction of the transmitted power that the receiver receives. And for optical fiber, this goes exponentially with the distance. So this is why the rate of quantum communication falls exponentially with the distance and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, in fact, the rate drops to zero at a certain maximum distance, depending upon how much excess noise you have in your detectors or um, any sorts of source of excess noise. The only way to get around this exponential loss is to introduce along the length of that communication, the fiber or free space, these devices called quantum repeaters to evade this direct transmission limit. So uh, before we talk about repeaters, um, let's see how a single quantum communication link works. So I described to you this whole diagram of how classical communications work. Quantum communication can work in two different ways. One looks very similar to what I described to you for classical communication. You know, I have K data qubits I want to send. I put it through an encoder. The encoder is now a quantum computer. It takes N minus K extra qubits that are initialized as some ancillas. You put it through some circuit, you get N qubits, which is larger than K. So you have added redund redundancy. And then I take these N qubits, my say spin-based qubits or trap time qubits or whatever it is. I modulate that into photonic qubits. Okay, so this is unlike the BPSK modulation that I talked about in classical communication. For quantum communication, there are different other modulation formats. There's cat state encoding, you know, GKP encoding, dual rail encoding, single rail encoding, all sorts of optical modulation formats for qubits. Then on the other side, there's the reverse set of steps and you get back your K data qubits. Hopefully, uh, if you have enough redundancy, you had added. This is called one-way quantum communication. There is a different way in which you can do quantum communication that is called two-way quantum communication. So there is no classical analog for this. Here, what you do is that you start by attempting to generate N noisy entangled qubit pairs by simply generating entanglement that's in the middle of the channel and sending it to two, two sides or generating entanglement on one side and then just transmit one of the qubits of an entangled state on the other side. So you shore up N noisy entangled qubit pairs and you push these uh, N noisy entangled pairs through two little quantum computers, I'm calling them decoders, and uh, you extract K very good quality entangled states where K is less than N. Okay, so this is called entanglement distillation, this last step. And uh, once you have these K near ideal quantum uh, entangled states, then you can use, if I have my K data qubits I want to send, I can use uh, teleportation to send these qubits over to the other side. So I'm achieving the same goal at the end of the day, but uh, the architectures uh, underlying these two types of quantum communications will look very different. Okay, so I've spoken about the philosophy of these two ways of quantum communication. I'll only stick to the two-way quantum communication to describe to you how a single quantum link is formed. So uh, if I want to say generate entanglement between two qubits, and I'm going to talk about these uh, spin-based qubits or uh, that are uh, say encoded in uh, what are called vacancy centers in diamond. I'll tell you a little bit more about these qubit forms we are looking at. So these blue circles are say a qubit sitting in a box 
that I can hold on to. The red one is a photonic qubit that I transmit to the middle of, uh, say, uh, this this elementary channel, this link. One, uh, there are two philosophical ways, two, two, two ways in which you generate entanglement between two and the two qubits. One is called swap in the middle, one is called source in the middle. In the swap in the middle, you generate entanglement between a spin qubit and a photonic qubit on one side, and another side also an entanglement between spin qubit and photonic qubit. And you send the photonic qubit to the middle of a channel, you put them through a beam splitter, you do an interference. Uh, this is a swap or an entanglement swap. And if you get a right click pattern on these detectors, you herald a successful entanglement between the spin qubits. And the other way, uh, the, the other philosophy of generating entanglement between two spin qubits, you put a source in the middle of the channel. For example, an entanglement source generated using a spontaneous parametric down conversion. Or if you want to look at this paper, we have the uh, proposal for a heralded multiplexed uh, source of high rate um, by, by photon generation, which then you load onto quantum memories, say using what is known as the Duan Kimball scheme. Okay, so uh, first of all, let's let me describe to you a little bit about uh, the quantum memories that we are working with in CQN. So these are called silicon vacancy color centers. Uh, if a diamond lattice okay, of, of carbon atoms and uh, two uh, nearby carbon atoms um, th that are missing in the lattice. So this is what a vacancy is in the lattice and it is replaced by a big silicon atom. Okay. And the free electron in that silicon atom whose energy diagram I'm drawing here, that serves as the qubit. So you have an external magnetic field that uh, uh, you know, uh, does the Zeeman splitting of the, of the ground state into these two levels that I'm calling down and up. This serves as my qubit. And this is the first uh, uh, the excited state, it's uh, branches, uh, the Zeeman split I'm calling down prime and up prime. This transition from down to down prime is roughly 737 nanometer. Okay, so group four vacancy centers are very good because they don't have a permanent electric dipole moment. So they are very much more stable than say nitrogen vacancy color centers. And then uh, we are also exploring these uh, higher, uh, uh, you know, these more heavier uh, group four element color centers because they are, they have uh, uh, their decoherence properties is uh, much better uh, at a warmer temperatures, say at one to two Kelvin. Whereas for silicon vacancy, you have to get, get down to hundreds of millikelvins if you want to get good coherence times. So anyway, so the, how do these qubits work? If you want to generate entangled photons, uh, you start by initializing the qubit in the equal superposition of up and down. And this zero is simply saying that there is no photon right now. So it's just down plus up. And then you excite it with a strong optical, you know, 737 nanometer laser pulse. So what happens is that this down state population, it goes to the down prime. And then the moment you turn off the laser pulse, it emits a single photon and comes back down to down. So you get a down one plus up zero over root two. So because the up never even went anywhere. So because this is detuned away from 737. So this is an entangled state between the spin and the photonic qubit. But the photonic qubit is encoded by the presence or absence of a single photon in one mode. It's called single rail encoding. I could have also changed the initial weight to something else, I would have gotten a, a weighted, a different weighted uh, superposition of up one and down zero. Now, I didn't have to stop at this point. After this first step of exciting with a laser pulse, when I get a down up, uh, down one plus up zero, I can apply a microwave uh, pipe uh, pulse to flip the spin. The up goes to down and the down goes to up. So I get this state and I can re-excite it with a laser pulse. And now what will happen that now the down state will generate a photon in the second time bin. So I'll get a state that looks like this. Okay, so there are two time bins involved. And my I can interpret these two time bins as my photonic qubit, but my qubit is now being encoded by the presence of a one photon in the first time bin or the second time bin. This is called a dual rail photonic encoding. So no matter which way I encode by this photonic qubit, this red ball is in a single rail or dual rail, I can generate entanglement upon between the two spin qubits by having them interfere on this beam splitter and looking for a particular click pattern for successful heralding. And then ask, what is the distillable entanglement? What is the quality of the entanglement between these two spin qubits? So if you want to read about the trade-offs between which form is better uh, in terms of entanglement uh, properties, you can take a look at this paper by my student Prajit Dhara and my colleague, Professor Dirk England at MIT. All right, so uh, this has been demonstrated by uh, our colleagues, uh, Misha Lukin and Marco Lonkers group at Harvard University. So the, last year, they did the first experiment where they generated successful entanglement between two silicon vacancy color center spins that are in distinct 
vacancies just in qubits by using uh, this photonic heralding method that I talked about. Now these yellow balls I'm showing around the blue. So this blue is this electron spin that I was drawing that level structure for. These yellow things are nuclear spins. Nuclear spins of either say the silicon 19 nuclear spin or maybe carbon lattice, carbon atom nuclear spins that are close by to the electron spin to which you can um, have a hyperfine coupling to. So what you do is that the moment you generate this photonic qubit entangled with the electronic spin, because electronic spin is what can generate a photon entangled with it, you immediately would use that hyperfine introduction to store that qubit into a nuclear spin because these nuclear spins are much longer lived. Say, for example, one to two second long in uh, coherence times, whereas electron spins, uh, depending upon your temperature, could be so, sort of microseconds of microseconds uh, in terms of its um, uh, T2 times or coherence times that you can get. Uh, I mentioned the source in the middle approach. So one of the reasons we were looking at the source in the middle approach, not the swap in the middle, um, was motivated by satellite-based entanglement distribution. And uh, this particular paper, we studied uh, uh, how uh, a source in, uh, that can be generated that can generate photons at a very high rate, but of a very high fidelity by taking two SPDC sources, spontaneous parametric down conversion sources, and have a Bell measurement within the source uh, using a beam splitter followed by a spectrally resolved photon detection. So at random, uh, at every time step, you get a heralding of uh, two photons that are entangled that comes out of the source at uh, different frequencies. And you send that to the ground station with the information about that which frequency information. And then you do a spectral um, center frequency conversion and a temporal mode conversion to match it with a memory, your quantum memory's ban optical bandwidth, and you load that into the mem uh, optical memory using what is called the Duan Kimball method. And this method was uh, invented by uh, uh, Jeff Kimball's group many years ago, where if you have a dual rail encoded qubit uh, that encodes your qubit by presence of a photon in one of two time bits, for example, uh, you initialize a spin qubit in this up plus down state, and then uh, you can arrange it such that if you, ref you what you do is that you reflect off only one of these two time bends uh, off of the cavity that encodes the, that spin qubit. And if the qubit is in the down state, and if you reflect off a photon off of that, you get a minus sign. You get a phase on the, on the reflected photons. You get this entangled state between your qubit and the spin after that reflection. And then you put these two modes that encode the qubit, these two time bends into a beam splitter, followed by two detectors. So that photon gets killed with that measurement, but depending upon which two of the two detectors click, you get this state of the spin qubit with the plus and the minus sign, and then you can correct for this sign because you know which detector clicks. So effectively, you take you've got this photonic uh, dual rail qubit that you were able to map into the the, the state of the atomic qubit. So this step, uh, it's kind of looks like teleportation. This was the idea behind Duan and Kimball scheme, which my colleague Dirk England's group has uh, built a system that can use this method to actually load the qubits into color center memories. Okay, so again, recap, I have talked about two methods, swap in the middle and source in the middle, but the end product is the same. You're generating entanglement between spin qubits that are held remotely, connected by your optical fiber, for example, or a free space link. But if you let these entangled states sit in the your quantum memory at a, any given temperature, depending upon what your temperature is, so these are these each line is uh, drawn for a different temperature, you have a decay of your distillable entanglement, meaning the quality of the entanglement as they sit as a function of time. And this decay rate is a function of temperature and the cause for this decay comes from um, uh, phonon-induced decoherence, which uh, we studied in this paper. If you're interested, take a look. But depending upon how bad your entangled state gets, the more the coding overhead or the distillation overhead you're going to need, that N over K ratio that I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, in order to get uh, good quality entanglement. You'll need more poor quality entanglement to get one good pair if your initial entanglement is poorer. Okay, so that is the, uh, um, uh, so you have to fight that decoherence properly um, by error correction. So my colleague, Professor Dana Friedman at MIT, um, she's a part of our center. So her group is uh, looking at um, uh, synthetic qubits. So why only take these you no know, color center qubits that nature gave us? If I had full freedom of designing spin-based qubits um, you know, uh, using say uh, molecules 
that uh, can be engineered to emit that photon at 1550 nanometers instead of 737 nanometers. I will never have to worry about frequency conversion. What if I can generate the, uh, the you know, the phonon um, uh, pathways in a way that the decoherence mechanisms are much better suppressed than silicon vacancy color centers? So our group is looking at uh, this problem of molecular qubits. Okay, so now that uh, once we have a single link, then you can, uh, if you, you know, this is, you generate entanglement between say two color center, you have stored them into the neighboring nuclear spins. And then, as I said, you generate entanglement using this uh, bell measurement, but I can have now multiple nodes that are sending these photonic qubits to one location and you can do bell measurement between any pairs. So you can create a quantum switch to generate entanglement between any, any pairs that are connected to this hub. And uh, what can you do with such a quantum switch? How can you do, what are the switching policies that will deliver entanglement to these net, uh, nodes that can uh, enhance the performance of a, say, a, of a um, uh, distributed uh, magnetic field sensor or a distributed, say, a sensor of a, a, the pressure gradient or temperature gradient. So there's a lot of work on these switching policies that my colleague, Professor Don Towsley and others in the center have been working on. This is just a cartoon of a test bed uh, that we are building in University of Arizona's campus in Tucson, led by my colleague Matt Eichenfield. And uh, we will have uh, we are we have one hub node in our ECE department, uh, three uh, nodes that have uh, that that have color center qubits, and then again uh, one of them have we are working with a thin vacancy color center. One other uh, node we have a silicon vacancy color center. So we are doing hybrid entanglement generation. But the main idea again is the switchable swap and the swap in the middle approach uh, and uh, frequency conversion to make them compatible. Okay, so now I have talked about generating spin-spin entanglement between uh, say two parties. Uh, what if you what do you do to connect those spin-spin entangled state fragments? So this is a nuclear spin, that's a nuclear spin. These are nuclear spins. Now you want to do a bell measurement between these two nuclear spins. And the way this works is that now you exploit that hyperfine interaction uh, to do the gate between them. So what you do first is that you generate a fresh entanglement between these two electron spins using the same method that I mentioned before. You emit photons and then do a bell measurement. And after that, you use this uh, hyperfine interaction between the local electron nuclear spin to do a control not gate. Okay, so this has been also demonstrated by Misha Lukin's group last year. And once you do that control dot gate, you create entanglement between this way, so between electron and the nuclear spin, then you do a measurement on the electron spin. That's just a microwave readout. And once you have a measurement, this is the entangled state you get. And then you have to read out the nuclear spins. And this readout is much more difficult. You typically would have to get it back to the electron spin and then do a microwave spin readout. And once you are done, you will get an entanglement between the remote nuclear spin. So you have to do all these steps to get that uh, bell swap to work on two nuclear spins. So this asynchronous bell measurement is our focus in another test bed that Professor Dirk England leads in the Boston area between MIT campus and Harvard University campus and MIT uh, Lincoln Laboratory in Lexington, which is about 40 kilometers away from MIT main campus. Okay, and uh, this asynchronous bell measurement was uh, demonstrated in a standalone experiment at Harvard University a couple of years back. In this paper, uh, Mihir Bhaskar, he now leads a, a quantum networking group out of Amazon um, in the, based in the Boston area, where the first time they beat this repeaterless bound that I mentioned in my first slide on quantum communication. So that was a big achievement. But uh, integrating that as part of our quantum network is a, is a bigger task. Okay, so I have told the bulk, bulk of the story and the rest uh, I'm going to skim over at a, at a slightly higher level. Uh, so now what is the next step in order to build a repeater? So a repeater is there where what you do is that you do this entanglement generation between two nodes with using a multiplexed entanglement generation process. You try many times and you keep one success and uh, you do that many times to generate a several, you know, hopefully good quality, but not perfect quality entanglement between uh, two hops, between a single, you know, single link. And then you do entanglement distillation. So you have these entangled states you have generated, then uh, you apply some quantum logic on each side and uh, you say from three, you go to one. But this one will probably have a higher quality than the, the original three that you had. So there's a whole line of work we are doing led by these three colleagues of mine 
uh, on entanglement distillation codes. Like if I tell you what the entangled state, what was generated between the spin spin, the, between the two spins using either the swap in the middle or the source in the middle approach, I give it to my computer science colleagues and say that, how do you just design the best possible circuit that can distill entanglement for that particular entangled state that was generated by your spin qubits? Uh, and then in order to build this, uh, these uh, circuits, you have to have massively integrated color centers integrated on a photonic chip uh, that you can generate local entanglement with, which, which you do that quantum logic. And uh, that integrated uh, color center chips using photonic integrated circuits is something that my colleague Dirk England and Matt Eichenfield are collaborating on. And once you have uh, these repeater stations, which have the ability, so these blues are blue circles are again atomic qubits, red are photonic qubits, that you can generate photonic qubits entangled with atomic qubits. You can do arbitrary logic, quantum gates between these atomic qubits. Then what you do is that you build a chain out of them. Okay, so at every time step, you are trying entanglement between, over a hop and you succeed or fail. But at a repeater station, you know the successes on your left and know the successes on your right, and you at every time step, you connect the successes by uh, making a bell measurement, say, between the commensurate quantum uh, memories, and you connect uh, an end to an entangled state. And we do all the math, and this is also a big research direction uh, people are looking at across the world. You can generate an entangled bits per second rate that outperforms what you can do without a quantum repeater. So that rate versus distance bound that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, you can outperform that. Uh, if you can build these quantum repeaters. Um, you can also build quantum repeaters using trapped ion systems, a work that we are working in collaboration with uh, Professor Ido Vax at University of Maryland and Norbert Linke. Uh, trapped ion systems are very, very good at quantum logic. In fact, much better so than color centers. But uh, we have chosen color center qubits because they're potentially a lot more scalable in terms of number of qubits you can have you know, per, uh, in, a, in, a, in a single chip than a trapped ion system. Um, you can build repeaters out of photonic cluster states. There's something called all photonic quantum repeater. It's a very interesting direction where even without a quantum memory, no color center or trapped on memory, you can mimic the action of a quantum memory by generating a, say, a, an entangled state of say 40, 50 photons called cluster states, which all of these photons remain in an entangled state that serve as a logical qubit that mimics the action of storage for a certain amount of time while the qubit that is entangled with it flies to your neighboring node and gets entangled and that information comes back. So these are the trade-off is that, well, you don't have to have a memory. You, you don't need that construction process. But then at the same time, you it is very hard to generate these cluster states. So there are there's a company called SciQuantum, for example, came out of Jeremy O'Brien's group in Bristol. They're based in Palo Alto. They are working on all photonic quantum, compu quantum computers and they have to generate these cluster states of photons. Now, when you generate for all photonic qubits, even there, there's a trade-off between different forms of encoding of the qubit in the photon. Do you use dual rail qubits? Do you use GKP qubits? GKP stands for Gottesman, Kitaev, Priskel uh, qubits. So even within all photonic repeaters, there are all sorts of considerations in terms of how what, what do you do to generate that cluster state? What is the qubit encoding? How do you embed the qubit in the photon? What kind of quantum circuit do you use to generate them? What, what is the error correction code that you use? And so that, that is a whole line of research that we are looking at. So there's lots of important enablers to build that fault tolerant repeater. And I've already mentioned all of these things. I'll not go through them. Photon pairs, photon pair source for the source in the middle, uh, good quality matter qubits, and demonstrating these asynchronous quantum logic and high fidelity, uh, you know, loading of the entangled state from the photonic entangled states into the spin-based qubits. All of these are important things. So now, well, once you have built a repeater, now you want to go to the next step and build a network. So at a repeater node, I said that, well, what do you have inside a repeater? You have memories. You have an interface between the memory and a photonic qubit. You can do any gates or measurements and gates on, on these uh, quantum uh, qubits that are stored in the memory. You can do unitary operations connecting to qubits, like a control not or a control Z gate. Uh, you can have a photonic entanglement source within the node if you want to. And you have some classical computing and communication interface. And then you can ask, uh, start asking network scale questions. You can say that, well, if I have, say, two parties, Alice and Bob, trying to generate entanglement 
uh, in a network and send every edge in every time slot, you're successfully heralding two qubit entangled states at probability P. So these are lines in denote successful entanglement, broken lines, there's no entanglement. And if I'm sitting over here at a router and I know which of the entanglements were su su successful in a given time step around me, I only have local link state knowledge. How should I choose my policies in terms of what qubits to do a bell measurement on locally, for example, or what distillation protocol to use so that my end-to-end -end entanglement between the two parties whose positions I know in the overall network topology will be maximized. And turns out that you can outperform with a very simple heuristics, the rate that you can achieve by pre-selecting a shortest path and doing a repeater along it. So you can exploit what is called multi-path advantage or multi-path diversity that has been very well known in classical network theory. Uh, if you allow yourself to do instead of just bell measurement, if you can do three qubit GHZ measurements. This is my student Ashlesha Patil. She did this paper along with some of my co colleagues. You can do even better quality, better rate entanglement generation by using uh, 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 result from percolation theory. In, so which means that if there is a regime of link success probability P and your probability of success of making that GHZ projection, which she calls Q, if you're in, the, in this regime, you can have a distance independent entanglement generation. Your rate will not even scale as a uh, with the distance or scale very gently with the distance. If you allow yourself to do time multiplexing in addition to GHZ measurements, meaning, so here these three lines show three time steps. Okay, and this is a node that is connected to its nearest neighbors. If there is no line means that was, that was an unsuccessful entanglement generation attempt. You can do say three qubit GHZ projections, but you can connect entangled states that were generated between qubits at different time steps. At that repeater node, you can improve that percolation region. You can do even better in, in terms of your entanglement generation. But designing error correction codes and distillation protocols for that can support these schemes are still open questions are and are being looked at. So now I'm at that level, layer of uh, routing and scheduling. And then what if there are two parties that are simultaneously trying to generate entanglement or doing quantum communication over the same network? So these red pairs and the green pairs, what should these repeaters do? How should their policies be designed? Should they uh, time share between supporting the two flows or do something clever? And for very simple cases, you can show that you can beat single uh, time sharing the, between every repeater says that, okay, lambda fraction of the time, I'll support one flow, one minus lambda fraction of the time, I'll do the best thing for the other flow. You can do much better than that by, by clever routing methods. So there's a whole host of problems in quantum networking, and I only gave you the flavor for that. You know, there's resource allocation like problems that I was talking about between multiple flows. How do you control and tomography of a network? Uh, designing a network, how do you place my repeater nodes? How do you provision? You know, if I have a some, some number of memories, how should I allocate them? And then finally, how do you design this entire protocol stack? Starting from, you know, I talked about generating that raw entanglement, choosing those physical layer qubits, up, up, up a level to doing entanglement distillation protocols, up another level doing these network routing and schedule uh, protocols, then scheduling multiple flows, and then above that will your applications that will consume that entanglement. Just like the classical internet, the whole stack has to be designed. So in our center, you know, we, uh, we have two test beds, as I mentioned, in Boston and Tucson area. Uh, there are four research thrusts that these colleagues are leading, um, and they are all connected to each other. So this research thrust four is very interesting. Uh, we are uh, researching societal impacts of quantum technology. So this thrust is led by colleagues at departments of law, so, uh, social behavioral sciences, economics, and so forth. Um, we're, we're considering like really long-term applications of quantum network-related technologies and what will their societal impacts be and how do you learn from that and 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 inform our, our technical research right now. Uh, my colleague Stefan Krustanov at University of Amherst, uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst is developing a full stack uh, simulator that will go all the way from noise and uh, you know spin-based logic to spin photon interfaces all the way to application layer. And everybody in our center, all the 150 people, including faculty, students, we will all have one part of this simulator that we can uh, work with uh, in terms of you know being uh, our research affecting or improving the metrics associated with that black box, which will show up um, uh, in terms of its performance at the network level. 
So this program, as I said, was funded as part of the NET NSF's uh, Engineering Research Center program. It's uh, it's a uh, ERC as a program was founded in 1985. They're funded for 10 years at roughly $50 million. And uh, these pro this program is designed to take a technical area that is just you know, at this level where a 10 year long, highly transdisciplinary push will take a technology to a point where it is ready for wide scale adoption by the industry and the society. There was no quantum topic ERC funded before ours. So ours is the first quantum related topic for an ERC. But the ERC program, you can go to their website, you'll see there are lots of very, very fun, very interesting ad advanced engineering topics um, that they have you know, every two years, they fund three centers uh, spanning all engineering topical areas. These are our industry members and FFRDC members and government labs that are part of our center in the different membership levels. And there's actually one company from India based in Hyderabad, Q Labs. They just recently joined our center. The rest of them are all US-based companies. And there's one UK company, QNET, uh, not QNET, uh, it's New Quantum is the UK company. Uh, they're all over the place. Some are defense contractors, some are small startups that are working on quantum networking. And uh, we are working with them in all sorts of different ways. Uh, so this is our new center uh, building that we are going to move to next year. It's part of our Grand Challenges Research Building. So if you're interested in learning more of our, about our work or visiting us in Tucson, uh, definitely contact me. Uh, we launched a new master's program in quantum information science and engineering at University of Arizona. And we are now extending that uh, to our partner universities, especially starting with MIT and University of Massachusetts Amherst. And uh, then I'll just end in the last uh, couple of minutes with a few glimpses of research projects that sit at the periphery of the work that I talked about, but in my own research group. So I have a, a group of about 30 members, we have 18 PhD students, several postdocs, scientists, and so forth. My own interest, research interest, is in photonic based information processing. Uh, wherever light gets used, whether it's communication, imaging, sensing, how do you exploit the quantum properties of photons? To, to process, carry information better uh, or encoding information, processing information from in the context of imaging, sensing, communications, et cetera. So I already mentioned your this work on spin-spin entanglement generation, um, either using the swap in the middle or source in the middle, uh, decoherence modeling of color centers, all photonic quantum repeaters that I mentioned before. Um, students are working on uh, uh, entanglement routing policies that deliver entanglement for entanglement assisted sensor networks like magnetic field sensors or you know, uh, long baseline interferometers and so forth. Uh, I mentioned these uh, network uh, routing policies and there's a lot of interesting work in this area that, that connects with error correction theory and networking. Um, we have a little bit of an experimental group work in our group. My postdoc, um, Alison Rubinock and Ian Tillman, graduate student, they're working on building a non-deterministic linear amplifier for an all-photonic quantum repeater. Um, part of a Army Research Office MURI program, we are, we are looking at uh, measures of entanglement across bipartitions of noisy graph states. Uh, uh, my colleague uh, Kanu Sinha at ASU, she's going to join U of A next year. Uh, we are collaborating with her on exploring non-Markovian collective effects um, uh, to generate entanglement directly between two spins that are connected to through an optical waveguide. So no heralding. So just two spins emitting photons into a waveguide and uh, that interaction itself creating entanglement between the spin degrees of freedom. Uh, my P now Bushkan is a new PhD student. She comes from Bitspilani. She is uh, looking at how you can turn a near-term quantum processor called Gaussian boson sampler that interferes a few modes, excited and squeezed state, and detect photons at the output. How do you use that as as a accelerator for solving graph classification problems? Uh, I mentioned these receiver designs for enhancing classical communications at the very beginning of my talk. My student Jack Bosselwaite and postdoc uh, Chauhan uh, Sui, they are uh, looking at an experimental design, which hopefully we'll be um, announcing the next uh, couple of months or so, which have for the first time demonstrated super, super additive capacity that I was talking about, making measurements on multiple symbols to get better capacity in terms of number of bits you can encode per pulse. Uh, this is being funded by NASA uh, for deep space communications. All photonic quantum repeaters is a big 
part of a work we do for Oak Ridge National Lab on another DOE center on quantum networking that we are part of. Um, uh, there's a whole research thread on photonic and optical imaging and sensing. So my former student, Michael Grace, um, he studied the quantum limits of resolution. So these are three stars you're looking at in a highly sub field of view. A conventional camera thinks that you have these two stars that are uh, far apart because they are very close. They're much smaller than your diffraction limit. But if you design an all optical pre-processing before the detection, you can get much better resolution. So these super resolution techniques then go on to multi-aperture systems uh, and then lead to you know, uh, long baseline interferometry uh, and attaining the best possible performance the laws of physics allows you to resolving uh, complex constellations of stars and exoplanets and what have you. My student Venua is looking at using squeeze light that has been passed through a mode sorter to generate spatially entangled probes that can do high precision beam deflection measurements for say atomic force microscopy. Uh, we are looking at how shared entanglement can be used to enhance classical communication rate in a high noise environment using what is called entanglement assisted classical communication. So you're now pre-shared entanglement is being used to boost classical communications beyond that whole level limit that I talked about at the beginning that does not use this pre-shared entanglement. Uh, using entanglement to boost the performance of RF photonic sensors, uh, using a uh, local quantum processing for better decoding capability of classical communication rate I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk. Generating squeeze light. And this is what is going to be uh, enabling these atomic force and uh, microscopy, uh, high just beam deflection measurements that I mentioned that my student Venhua is working on. And finally, this is a fun topic that came out of the Engineering uh, Research Center's Education Workforce Development Program. My student Ashlesha, she developed a new version of this game of Tetris, like a tangram puzzle, where uh, if you get better and better at playing her version of this game, and we are going to release the game soon online, you will unknowingly also get better at mapping a quantum circuit into the cluster state model of quantum computing more and more resource efficiently. Um, here's a workshop that I started several years ago to try to connect uh, the communities of quantum information theorists, um, nonlinear quantum optics, and integrated photonics to start to come together and think about the large, you know, the, the, the identify the high impact applications in, in this intersection of quantum and photonics enabled information processing. Again, if you're interested, we uh, please let us know. We had our seventh uh, workshop, uh, SIPUNIP last year. All right, so there has been lots of investment in uh, quantum technologies in the US and worldwide in the last two years. The Department of Energy funded these six centers. National Science Foundation funded these six centers. Our ERC is one of them, but there are all these you know, quantum leap challenge institutes. They are five-year programs instead of 10-year programs. So with all of these investments, you know, and uh, the, the timing seems appropriate. You know, right now, India started its national quantum mission, and there's a lot of excitement around that. Uh, and uh, I feel that the field is ready for a very highly interdisciplinary science, engineering, education convergence. And the question is, will the community live up to the expectations? I mean, we do need to also study uh, applications of this new service of quantum communications uh, to uh, to push the field forward, technology maturation across all of these la layers, the device layer, all the way from physical layer, network layer, application layer. So it's a very, very important topic. I'm, talk I'm talking about, you know, you, you saw the whole progression from the beginning to the end. At the very, you know, we were discussing, when we were discussing networking repeaters and protocols, we are talking about, you know, thousands to millions of qubits per repeater node. In our state-of-the-art experiment at Harvard University, we have entangled two color center spins, very high fidelity gates. We have generated these control knot gates using hyperfine interactions. We have generated, say, GKP qubits or single photon encoded qubits encoded uh, entangled with a color center spin. So all the puzzle, the building blocks that all the pieces of the puzzle are there, but to bring them together to build this uh, these systems is ext extremely challenging engineering challenge. Uh, so uh, in, in identifying stakeholders early adopters, people who can engage with the right expertise and creating the ecosystems that can actually enable such convergence will be the key to success, right? So with that, I'll thank my research group, my collaborators and my funding agencies. And I'll stop here to take any questions if there is any, thank you. Right, uh, so thank you for the wonderful talk, uh, Professor Shankar Guha. 
uh, it was amazing to learn all the activities that you are conducting. I mean, um, uh, the team that you are leading, it's probably a very, very effective team because you have multiple collaborations going on across universities. And uh, I can see that you're collaborating not only with uh, people uh, from your own background, but you're also reaching out to people who are uh, forming from, let's say, with a different expertise, right? And I think uh, this is, I think, one of the most important hallmarks of your talk that you've given today, that, uh, you know, interdisciplinary collaboration is very critical to, uh, you know, uh, get uh, some kind of uh, benefit out of this uh, endeavor, right, in some sense. So, so with that, I would uh, like to open the forum for questions. Uh, so uh, if there's anyone who wants to uh, go ahead, you can please raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you and you can proceed with your question. Check out if there is any question from the YouTube. Yeah, that's what I was also thinking. So if uh, one of the students could uh, check out the yeah. YouTube uh, chat box and let us know, uh, and maybe he or she can relate the question yeah. to Professor Guha, that would be uh, useful. And you're definitely welcome to contact me. There was a lot of information in my talk. Uh, yes, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It was very dense, I must but, say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> very dense talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it was it was good to get a, yeah. a overview and, uh, you know, a, a flavor of both the theoretical and the experimental aspects that you're touching upon through your research, right? Uh, so that is something very nice and unique that you have been uh, doing it with your group there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if there are no questions right now, maybe we can ask a few questions. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you you probably mentioned that, you know, mm, uh, that, uh, uh, oh, okay, no, there is some one question. Okay, before I put my question, uh, there's something. Uh, yeah, I, I just read the question. So didn't they understand a CQ and test pen? So yeah. uh, what, uh, what we are doing in our Tucson test, uh, generating entanglement. So first step is to generate hybrid entanglement. So what is hybrid entanglement? Uh, entanglement generation between two different types of color centers. So you have a tin vacancy color center and a silicon vacancy color centers. The photon that they will generate that are entangled with the spins will be at different wavelengths. Mm. So in order to do a bell measurement between them, you have first have to do frequency conversion. So demonstrating that is a there are lots of engineering challenges to get to that step. Actually do state tomography that you can generate pretty shared entanglement between them. Now, not just that, let's say you have three different nodes with three different types of cub qubits that are sending photons that are entangled with those pins to one common location. At that location, you can do bell measurements between any pairs at any given time step. So you can generate start generating entanglement pairwise between these different, different, different nodes. Um, possibly even multi-qubit entangled states by doing uh, different photonic interference and detection patterns in every time step. If you are distributing that entanglement to these three nodes to enhance the performance or performance of a distributed sensor, for example, what is a distributed sensor? Let's say you have say a uh, say a magnetic field sensor that that uh, using these color centers as your sensor to detect a local magnetic field. Uh, how should you route entanglement? What should be your switching policy that maximizes the sensitivity enhancement, the quantum Fisher information, for example, for improving the sensitivity? This is just one example. Okay, so and and uh, in our Boston test bed, that's where we are building a repeater where you need asynchronous bell measurements for which you have to use this nuclear spin assisted measurements that I talked about. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a flavor for what we are doing. Uh, so there's one more question. It is uh, hard to encode information in polarization of photons when using optical fibers. So we are using time bin encoding. Uh -huh. We are using time bin encoding. Uh, so remember I mentioned how you excite a color center once, you generate uh, this up a one plus down zero. 
and then you flip the spin using a microwave pie pulse and you excite it again with the 737 nanometer laser, you get an up zero one plus down one zero. So that zero one and one zero are two time bins. And you're encoding your qubit by presence or absence of the photon in one of the two time bins. So you're right that polarization encoding can be tricky, especially if you don't have polarization maintaining fiber, uh, but we are, we are using time bin encoding. Uh, right. Uh, so I think those two questions are addressed. Uh, anyone else who uh, wishes to post a new question, uh, more than welcome to do that. Yeah, and you're definitely welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions, especially students. Absolutely, here. absolutely. Uh, and I think free. probably you are also looking for good students, right? You you mentioned about this <laughs> new MS program, right? <laughs> so so uh, so so that would be a nice way to reach out to you. Absolutely, so, we are so, always looking for good students. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, so one question uh, regarding this, uh, this, um, you know, uh, the vacancy centers that you are using. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I guess right now you are operating at millikelvin temperatures, right? Uh, and uh, so one advantage is yes, definitely they are a good option if you want to scale it up, right? But then, uh, you know, mm, from a practical point of view. Uh, maintaining something at a millikelvin temperature over a wide uh, network uh, may pose some challenges infrastructurally, right? So, mm -hmm. it, are you are you also thinking about uh, you know uh, looking at possible color centers which can uh, let's say operate close to uh, room temperature, yes. but will will have the same efficiency and the same narrow band source, uh, you know, uh, which are going to be useful for these kind of uh, communication schemes, right? Absolutely, yeah. So we are, so we have a quite a fo uh, heavy research focus on tin vacancy color center. Right, right. And uh, even though all the results I showed, all the state of the art measurements we were we have done with silicon vacancies, but you right. make a good point that the best T two measurements right now still require a delusion fridge, hundred mm -hmm. millikelvin. Correct, so, correct. In vacancy color center, uh, Dirk England and uh, Matt Atatürk's group, they have. Uh, done some initial measurements that look very promising. Okay. In our CQ and test bed, Matt Eichenfield is now working on integrating tin vacancy color centers with PICs. And uh, we believe that we should be able to get pretty strong coherence properties uh, at uh, closer to a Kelvin or two Kelvin. Okay, okay. It's much better. Mm -hmm. the thing is though that the nuclear spin environment and the hyperfine uh, interactions with the nuclear spin is much less understood for tin. Okay, okay. And we'll, we are going to need that to do quantum logic on this. But we have gone ahead and uh, at, in Tucson, we we, are, we haven't even, we don't want to use Delfridge for any of our measurements. So what we have done is we have worked with a company called Photon Spot, uh, which sells superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. But they have custom designed a uh, cryostat for us, which with close cycle helium-3 can get us down to 300 to 400 millikelvin. I see. And, okay. And this, this cryostat costs you know, close to $200,000 as opposed to a million dollars for a Dell fridge. Regular, regular, yes. Regular, yeah. yeah. Regular. So, uh, and we are planning to use those for our quantum memory uh, experiments in Tucson. So we are approaching it from both sides, but you're absolutely right that these heavier color centers are much better, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of their co coherence properties at higher temperatures, but we have to do more physics and more engineering to understand how we can control the nuclear spins. Um, and, and, you know, and, uh, and nobody has generated any, you know, heraldic entanglement, uh, even you know, forget spin, spin, even spin photon entanglement. There's some people are just starting to do some work. I see. I see. So, so now that you mentioned this big technology to be integrated with the uh, vacancy centers, uh, you probably are also aware of the PIC program at NIST, where they're trying to do this uh, laser cooling and uh, you know trapping everything integrated on the PIC platform, right? So, no, no, no optics that are going to be movable. Everything on a chip. Lasers getting delivered. So, uh, like, uh, would you would you at some point envision? Uh, some kind of a hybrid architecture where you could use probably ions and your uh, uh, your uh, you know vacancy centers integrated such that you can use best of the both worlds, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That's a very good point. 
Um, Dirk England and I, we are uh, collaborating on a different NSF program called the Convergence Accelerator Program with Professor Ido Vax at University of Maryland. He okay. It's on uh, trapped iron qubits. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're exactly ans ans asking those questions. I see, I so see. We have a project underway where we are trying to generate a, you know, a heralded entanglement between a trapped ion, a dual species trapped ion, an iterbium and a calcium, um, uh, and a, uh, calcium ion. Calcium is your, or uh, no, in that one, it was the barium ion, which okay. is your optical. Barium ion that op is the optically excitable one, and the iterbium ion is the long-lived ion on which you, you know, use as your memory. Right, and we are working on frequency conversion to connect that to a color center, silicon vacancy color center, and just like you mentioned, Arjit, I mean the the hope is that we can leverage the quantum logic capabilities of trapped ion, which yep. is much better, um, and uh, switchable entanglement generation at a massive scale using a paper integrated platform using color centers right. to leverage hopefully the best of both worlds. So, uh, yeah, those are all excellent questions. So that's right. why I feel that. It is. It may be a little too early to say that. What is the qubit technology that will be good to build? Absolutely, the computers? absolutely, so, absolutely. So, so the other question that I think you you had pointed out at some point in one of your earlier meetings uh, is that you know uh, this bell state measurement, you know, and scaling up the entanglement over an entire network, right? Uh, that is something again which is going to be very very challenging, right? Uh, so, in terms of uh, uh, the physics limitations, if you could share some insight with our students. Yeah, uh, I mean, physics intuition for, for how, why the bell measurements are difficult or? Yes, uh, why they're difficult and why it is, uh, you know, difficult to scale it up across a network. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, I, as I mentioned, if you remember in my talk, the doing just a bell measurement between two qubits, two uh, spin qubits, require all these different steps. You start from you know, the qubits you want to make a bell measurement on, you have to first shelve that in the nuclear spin. That requires that to address that hyperfine interaction. Then you generate fresh entanglement from electron spin qubits. And then you do the control knot between the local nuclear spin qubits. And then you do the spin readout. Each one of these steps have been done individually. But to do that asynchronous bell measurement between two qubits is extremely hard. And then when we are building quantum networks, I'm talking about massively multiplex bell measurements. And not just bell measurements, maybe even three qubit GHZ projections. I mentioned yes. my student Ashlesha's work. Uh, and then when you do distillation, which is an absolutely important step to, just like in classical communication, you have to do error correction, you have to do distillation to build a quantum yes. network. The distillation circuit will involve quantum logic. Like mm. Control hard gates, Hadamard gates. So all single qubit gates are not too problematic. It's a microwave spin control. Two qubit gates are extremely hard. Two qubit ah. gates, you have to again leverage the nuclear spin mediated logic. Right. So then the, there is a theory problem of how do you take a distillation circuit and compile it in the best possible way, commensurate with the actual you no know, pulse sequences and the uh, coherence time properties and the hyperfine interaction strengths that is available in our color center qubits. Yes, yes. So, yes. So these are all very challenging questions. I'm very challenging. And, and these are, I guess, still uh, very open problems uh, that you're trying to address. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just think that I have to join another call right now with a colleague. No uh, problem. No problem. So, so, so maybe then uh, we can uh, end the session here. And yes. I join all my colleagues once again uh, to thank Professor Saikat Guha in delivering such an excellent talk and giving us a very good flavor of all the activities that are going on in his field of research, in his group, as well as through the Center for Quantum Networks, right? Uh, Professor Deshmukh, would you like to add, add some more points here? No, I think, um, uh, Professor Saikat Goha, we want to thank you. Uh, wonderful having you at this meeting. I'll just add that uh, do plan a visit to Tirupati sometime in the near future. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Next time I'm in India, Absolutely. I'll keep it in mind. Okay. Thank you very much for hosting me. Right. Thank, thank you so much for joining. Okay. okay. Goodbye. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs>